Well, today I get to speak with someone who I just discovered a week or so ago while I was on one of my nights just enjoying myself with a couple drinks, watching old YouTube videos or the old country music that I love uh, before country music stopped existing for the most part in the late 80s. And today I get to speak with Royce. Royce, tell us a, a little bit about you. Hello, man. I'm a country musician out of central Iowa. I've been playing country music for six years, um, working on my third record right now, play about 150 to 200 shows a year, you know, besides besides uh, when the Black Plague started. But besides that, I've been, <laughs> been a pretty busy guy. Um, yeah, that's about it, man. I've just been traveling all over playing music and uh, wow, that is a busy schedule. Like I thought that uh, you know most musicians maybe had one gig a month or something. You're hitting it hard. Yeah, man. I've I've played pretty much every Friday, Saturday since I was 19. Way so. to go. Way to bust it out. And you know, it's it's that's kind of how we met is I, I made a comment on one of your videos about how awesome you are. And I wish I could just put up all the money and, and fund you putting out that awesome, good old sound for the rest of your life. And, and you actually reached out within a few days, like, Hey, how are you doing? And and just like that kind of cold call, I was so impressed with and your work ethic really shows through. Do you, do you have a, a side hustle as well? Or is that your full-time gig is uh, singing? I've been, yeah, music's been my full-time gig for six years. Um, this December, I actually got my real estate license. So uh, just because I, you know, I, I I invest in rentals and stuff and uh, it's kind of been my main investment that I take all my money for music from type thing. And um, <laughs> support your habit. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, no, it's, it's kind of strange. It's kind of almost the other way around. Music supports everything else. And then I, and I'm like, well, what do I, you know, I, I know I'm not going to be able to play music forever more than likely. So it's like, well, I got to, I got to set my retirement up somehow. And I figured real estate was the best deal. Cause I, you know, I'd start out from, I bought my first house and then I bought my neighbor's house. He was moving. And then it's like, Oh, well, I guess this is, and I just kind of slowly learned about it and still am learning, but uh, got my license. So that way I can help friends and family when they, when they want to go buy something, you kind of get, you know, when you have access to an MLS, you're, you're first to know type thing. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's just been learning, you know, and, and I, I've some of my musician friends uh, have a brokerage. So it's kind of it was just like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, not a whole lot after COVID. I was kind of bored. So I went and got my license in like 10 days and then, uh, well, did all the testing and stuff and waited a month and got my license and then started working with them. So. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Has that been a, a huge thing? I would imagine it would be um, the whole, um, I don't think COVID was a problem, but the response to it has certainly been an issue. Has that really hindered your ability to go out and sing and play or have things stayed kind of as they, as they always were in Iowa? Yeah, no, they, they shut everything down because it was like March 16th. I did, I did. I remember the last show I did, I was uh, I was playing at Meskwaki Casino in uh, Tama, Iowa, opening for Sammy Kershaw, uh, Aaron Tippin, Colin Ray. And the next, I think it was like the next day or the next two days, they, they had the COVID shutdown. It was like March 15th or 17th or whatever. And then after that, I everything got canceled from March till pretty much – Oh man. I mean, September, you know, uh, yeah. and yeah, like, cause all bars, all bars were shut down and then they had limit and then they like would open limit, you know, there's like limits. You could have so many people and you'd have to have a, it was just, it's just goofy. Like we couldn't do, we really just couldn't do anything. It wasn't justifiable. You know, it couldn't, people couldn't dance. It was just kind of, uh, so I just took a step, a step back and said, well, you know, if they, if they ever decided to open it up again, I guess that's when I'll be playing. So. Yeah. Wow. I've, I've thought about that. I'm not in the, the restaurant or the bar in, this, in uh, industry, but I, my understanding is uh, from, from watching training videos, bar rescue, uh, my understanding is that it's a kind of a, a per square foot thing and you have to make so many dollars per square feet and you pack people in, in a certain way. And, oh, I feel for the restaurants over the last year that have, uh, you know, gone from having full capacity to third capacity or uh, whatever. So gosh, I'm glad you've been able to hang in there and you're back at it again. Um, 
So your music, I, the stuff that I love, I, I'm a, a George Jones, Ralph Stanley uh, senior uh, doctor, uh, the late Dr. Ralph Stanley, uh, John Prine and Waylon Jennings. Those are my kind of people. And then it seems oh, like yeah. uh, Daryl Singletary and you and well, Daryl died uh, about three years ago, but yep. you and Jamie Johnson, Mo Pitney, Sturgill Simpson, you guys are kind of keeping that old sound going. Is that your goal or did you just get lucky with a, a voice that has a good sound to it or how, how do you feel about the traditional versus the new stuff that some people call country? Oh shit. I could write a book on it. Um, <laughs> I, Daryl Singletary is one of my biggest vocal influences. Sturgill Simpson as well. That's funny you say those, those two are probably my two favorite singers um, dead and alive uh, for many reasons. Like uh, that's why I sing this way is probably one of my favorite records and meta modern sounds and country music is one of my favorite records and sailor's guide to the earth is one of my favorite records. Uh, and I, yeah, I mean, I, I love all that kind of music, man. And to be honest, I haven't flipped on a radio for six odd years and it was downhill before then, but uh, I can't even, I mean, I every once in a while I'll get my car just for kicks and giggles. It'll, it'll come on and I'll be like, what the hell? You know, it's like, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's hip hop music. It's hip hop backing. And it's just like the, the, the lyrics are uh, it's, it's just garbage. I mean, I guess I don't know how else to say it. It's just like, it's, it's taken such a, uh, there's just so much noise, you know, there's, there's no sustenance to any of the, any of the words. It's just, uh, you know, all, all the, all the traditional stuff is gone. You don't hear a pedal steel guitar in anything anymore, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, at least mainstream, you know, Nash FM cumulus radio style stuff. It's just, it's just gone by the wayside, but there is, there, there are a lot of really good independent artists out there that, you know, you're just not going to hear in radio, but I don't think most people listen to radio anyway. Right, right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a. It's been just an interesting switch in a, in a lot of ways that that the quiet voices, just like news. I, I think that there are very few people that watch mainstream news now. Most people have their favorite worldview, and we all, at least I, jump into my little echo chamber, and that's all I listen to and know about. Um, and I think yeah. the same is probably true with music. I don't have to listen to that stuff because it came on the radio. I can, I can go to odyssey.com or YouTube or whatever and just right. go on there and find good music. So thank you for putting out the good stuff. Okay. Um, Here's one of my favorite questions to ask when I get to chat with folks in different industries. Um, I was a cop for about 10 years. And, and when I would go to some just dinner party and somebody would say, hey, by the way, this is, is a shepherd. He was a, he was a cop here in town. The first thing people would say is, oh, this one time I got pulled over and they would describe the time that they got pulled over and ex extorted for whatever. And it wasn't and to me at the time, I, I was so sick of hearing about it because that was my daily thing. I did it 20 times a day. And to them, it was a huge deal. Right. And then I've noticed that with different industries. So so if I, you, you, you're at a party and somebody says, uh, hey, this is Royce. Royce, meet Jim. Uh, Royce is a, a country music singer. What does Jim say? <laughs> uh Hey, have you ever been on The Voice or you've been on American Idol? I, I, I you know, I, I get a lot of people that ask me that. And a lot of people like, you should go on The Voice. Or you should go on American Idol. And I, if, if there's one question that I could eliminate anybody from ever, ever asked me again, it'd be it'd be that. Because it's just like, <laughs> you know, I, I'm just so sick of hearing it, you know, but I get it. It's a compliment, but it's also like uh, it's I don't know. To me, it's just it's getting real old because <laughs> it's it's such a. It's, it's such a bad deal. It's like taking a, I guess if I had to equate it into anything business sense, going on The Voice or American Idol where you already have a music career that, that you make a living at, it's kind of like taking an adjustable rate mortgage on a half million dollar home with no limit. It's just like, <laughs> you're just rolling the dice, man. And they just keep you signing you just, every, every step of the way. They make you sign more and more stuff. Um, everybody yeah. I know has been on. It's just like, it's, you know, if you have nothing going on in music or like if you're not making if your primary thing isn't music, if like you're not making a living playing music and you, you have nothing to lose, really, uh, but by going on one of those shows. But if you do, they want rights to the records you've already made. They want they want to be able to say they can fabricate any story about you for TV. It's it's literally like signing your life away. They could they could they could go on national television, and say you had a drug habit. And, you, you know, in all, all sense, you had nothing to do with that. You know, uh, uh, they can create your own sob story. And they, they literally in the contract, it literally says we withhold the rights to, you know, uh, create any story about you for TV. And I'm just like that wow. right there. I, I, 
I, I, I'm blown away the amount of people that are willing to sign their life away without any uh, merit. It's, it's just wild to me, man. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, you, you expect it in reality TV. You expect that there isn't reality. And there's some things like one of my favorite shows. I grew up in a Mennonite community. So I used to love watching Amish Mafia. And it was so obvious that it was a ridiculous thing. But I have to admit, I, I didn't know the extent to which the voice or whatever would, uh, you know, say, hey, hey, Royce, your your daughter's going through this horrible arthritis thing. And, and this is what prompted you to write that. That's incredible. Yeah. Disgusting. You grew up a Mennonite? I did. Back hills of Tennessee, riding a horse to school and no electricity or running water. A little bit different for a 1970s and 80s upbringing, but wow. I sure loved it. When did you get out of that deal? Left in late 80s and headed out west. But yeah, How old I got you then. I was 16. So wow. I got to spend that whole time uh yeah, going to different little groups of it. But yeah, it was a it was a fun experience. Not everybody gets to do that in, in the last 50 years or 100 years anyway. So I was pretty lucky. So did you, like, I used to live in Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we, we knew a lot of different Amish folks and Mennonite communities. My dad, my dad, uh, he's in the fire safety industry and they sell fire alarms. And he literally, he'll go like, uh, he, he does all referrals from uh, Amish and Mennonite communities because they're, they're like uh, wind up alarms basically that don't use electricity. It's like a, it's like a mechanical patent, I guess that it's a bet. It's a great deal for Amish Mennonite community. But anyway, Neat. I've heard, I've heard and seen a lot about Amish Mennonite. That's really interesting. That you're part of that. Uh, did, did you grow up in like a, like a Dutch, like where, where you guys spoke Yiddish and stuff? Or? Yeah, They spoke Pennsylvania Dutch. And wow. uh, I didn't because I, I moved there as a, a worldly outsider at age two. And so, and there wasn't a, a father in the picture. So I was a, I was a, a bastard heathen that we, you know, we never fully joined their stuff. We just kind of moved from group to group. And wow. so we were never completely accepted, but yeah, when they wanted to say something and not have me understand it, they would break into their Pennsylvania Dutch. And uh, yeah, wow. it was, it was interesting. It was a good stuff. Yeah. Good That's and true, bad. Man. Yeah. yeah but I mean, it, it's a, it's a good, it's, I guess it's a good outlook. If you, I mean, if you, if you get to see it, there's, there's a lot of, a lot of really goofy stuff that goes on over there, but it's also, there's also a lot of good things, I guess, but I don't know. I, I guess I can't speak on it. What outweighs the good or bad, that, that kind of community. But. Yeah. And I think it's how we look at things. You know, I, I think that's such a big part of it. And that's, that, that's something that I kind of I like about, and it looks to me from view count and such, your truck stop souvenirs just went wild. Um, and I looked in there and it's almost like you found music as a way to teach some valuable lessons about work ethic and um, about parenting and about spending time together and uh, uh, somebody going out and working really long, hard hours away from the family in order to make stuff happen while the other parents stayed home and took care of business. And did, were you trying to make a big, strong social, this is how society could run better statement or was it, how did that song, song come about? Well, I, I didn't write the song. Um, my, my friend Robert Deitch wrote it and he's a songwriter from Iowa, uh, but he's been a staff song, songwriter at Dan Hodges Music uh, in Nashville for, oh, I don't know, 10 odd years or whatever. Uh, so, you know, he has a publishing deal where he'll go out and he'll write songs to other songwriters and they pitch them to larger artist type thing. And he wrote this song with Tony Hazelden back in, oh shit, probably 2012 or something like that. <clears throat> and right about then, that's when all that Florida Georgia Line stuff got real hot. So I don't know. I, I guess this is my assumption that that kind of a song wasn't really selling back then and okay. or, it just, or it didn't get pitched. I don't know. I mean... He said he said it never even got demoed or pitched. So it was a song they wrote, and it just sat on a sat in a catalog for you know eight years. And I and I met Robert like 2016. We reconnected 2017, 18, and and uh, he was showing me a catalog of his songs that weren't cut. And I, I'm like, well, why don't I just go make a CD of these songs type thing? I said, I you know I'm, I was kind of at a stage where I wanted to do a record, but I'm, I'm not a writer and I needed songs and he had songs that didn't weren't recorded. So it was kind of a perfect fit. Oh, he, great. he introduced me to the, the studio cats down there. We went out and recorded six, seven songs for that first record. And, uh, 
I just remember he, he showed me that song and like, he just played it for me in his living room, you know, by memory from his guitar. And I was just floored. I'm like, you know, that's my life story. You know, my, my dad traveled and, uh, you know, we, we stayed home and it, I, I don't know, it was just, it was just surreal. You know, it was, it was a, it's still one of my favorite songs this day. It's, it's, you know, it's written by Robert Deitch, Tony Hazelden. And, uh, I don't know, man, it, it told such a story. So. Yeah, I, I just love it because in our, uh, my wife and I, we've been married almost 20 years and, and we have a, a successful business for the last 11 years. And we've really incorporated um, the lessons from the book, uh, The Five Love Languages. And so we know all of our uh, staff, we know what their love language is, and we try to speak to them in that way. And as I'm listening to that song, I'm just seeing the the physical touch and the the gifts and the quality time and the acts of service. And I, I'm just thinking that was a, a really well done one. And you sing it with such soul and like you, you really believe it. And it's, that was great. So, Thanks, man. so that song got a lot of play and I'm thinking uh, that there are probably a couple other songs that you are just probably thinking, why in the world wasn't this song a, why didn't it reach the levels that I wished it would have? Why, what's, what are some of the songs you've done that you think probably should be the ones that are just getting millions of views? Oh man, I don't even know. Uh, I, I kind of knew when we did that CD, like that was going to be the title track. Cause it, it, I just knew it, it had such a compelling, I love story songs, you know, like riding with private Malone, David Ball is one of my favorite songs. It just illustrates such a, it's a good picture, right? Or, right. Uh, Lucille, you know, Kenny Rogers or Ruby, don't take your love to town. I, I love stories that, that it, it's just like a, it's like a really good movie, you know, it's like Forrest Gump, right? It's right. cliche, but it's, it's true. It's, it's, but it's like Forrest Gump in three minutes, you know, and I, I love stuff like that where there's resolve, and, but I also like really, you know, I like songs that are really out there and that, that don't have any resolve that, that, you know, it's like a, it's like a work of art kind of thing. And I, I love those kind of songs, but you know, those, those generally don't go over commercially, but that's okay. You know, th those are, those are songs that I like. Um, I think on that record, that was my favorite song on the record, uh, that or either way was one of my favorite songs. Okay. But, um, and uh, on this new record we put out in November, I mean, it's, it has, it doesn't have near the air, the near the amount of views or plays that the first one did. And I, I knew that would be the case cause it's, it's old covers and, and kind of old timey stuff that I like that, that you know, they're, they're newer songs we wrote, but uh, it was kind of for me anyway, you know, and it was more of an interesting pet project that I wanted to do. So. Uh, Good for you. And by, by the way, Royce, um, the way your name is spelled um, yeah. just to make sure everybody can go into uh, YouTube or Odyssey or wherever they're looking for things. Um, R O Y C E. And then Johns, that's right. Yep, J O H N S. Perfect, perfect. Um, so you have another album coming up soon. Yeah, well, I, so I just put out a record in November called One Last Two Step. It's comprised of original and some of my favorite old covers. Um, and then we're working on a third record right now. We got about four songs tracked, uh, but it's just it's literally the worst time in history to make a record because it's like you can't really well once they open things back up and if they do, then you can at least tour to pay for the record type thing. Right. But, you know, people don't really buy physical records. I mean, like people do through me, you know, to support the record, but they don't really even use the CDs, you know, they can get, they can stream it for free, but you know, it's like you buy a CD for 10 bucks and it's like, well, if a thousand people do that, then it pays for a record, you know? Right. Um, and that's hard. That's hard to sell a thousand copies nowadays, you know, especially independent, uh, I, yeah, but but I'm working on my third record right now. And so the the second record, the one that came out last November, is that maybe where I uh, is that the one that had he, he stopped loving her today? Uh, no, that, that was just that, we, that was just a live video we did. Uh, we we did an actual album cut of uh, what my woman can't do on that record, um, which was actually the same guy that had his hands and he stopped loving her today. Okay. But, God, I just love that that sound. That was uh, yeah, I was on a George Jones kick, and I heard you, and I thought, wow, that 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 cool voice isn't gone from the world. That's neat that you're carrying that on. 
So what haven't I talked to you today about or asked you about um, that you would like the world to know? Oh, man, I don't know. (laughs) Buy my records. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. Well, is that kind of how does that that model used to work very differently? And I remember back in the 80s buying at a swap meet in Tennessee, buying a uh, bootleg Randy Travis songs, I get probably in 82 or 83 or something like that. And now is the, the model that you get as much popularity as possible. You get as many people loving you as possible. And then when you go do shows, you can charge for them and you make some money at the show. And then you sell some t-shirts and hats and, or how, what's the business side of what you're doing? Well, it's, uh, (laughs) As an entrepreneur, it's probably the worst business to be in nowadays because it used to go back in the olden day. You write a song, you write songs, uh, and you know you make a record. And either you know if it's funded by a private investor label or you, but you know via your tour, um, you're able to sell that record and you can pay radio promotion. And through radio promotion, people will buy your records, right? And that that was kind of, you know, the record would fund everything. If you sell a million copies of something at 10 bucks a pop, you can do the math. But, right. you know, nowadays a Chris Stapleton won't even sell 30,000 copies or 50,000 copies of a record because people just don't buy them, right? Right. So it, it's, it's, it, all the money comes from the show. You, you know, uh, the idea is that people come to the show, they buy a ticket, they buy beer, you know, uh, drink sales are huge. Um, they, so, and, and the venue pays you, you know, you bring the people in and, uh, you know, you sell some t-shirts or you sell some CDs or whatever. And it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a totally different model. The, the, the good part is it's easier to get in front of a lot of people than it was 30 years ago. Uh, because back then you had, you know, nine people that controlled how, you know, how, how, how many million people get to see you, but now it's, it's up to the internet, which is a good and bad thing. Cause there's a lot of noise out there and there's a lot of just just shit, but <laughs> yeah. there's, there's no one to siphon that. But at the same time, it's kind of like equal opportunity. But then also, it's not because there's algorithms and people get people get bumped down for you know political reasons. You know, you say something that someone doesn't like, it work at Facebook or YouTube or whatever, and they'll they'll take you from they'll take you off the main page. I mean, it's just a different game. Same people, you know, same type of people run it, but just new tools available. Yeah. And it's so weird how some things work and some don't. I just did a funny little thing years ago. I bought a $10 CD on how to be a speed auctioneer. And then I, I I practiced just a tiny bit, probably three or four hours. And then I made a YouTube video on how to be a speed auctioneer, just an absolutely horrible one. And that has something like 30 or 40,000 views. And then what I'm really passionate about philosophy, uh, I'll do a wonderful 12 minute in depth. Uh, <laughs> anybody can listen for 12 minutes. This is going to be great. And I look at it at six years, you know, a year later and 13 views. I'm like, thanks a lot. You know, that's not the one I wanted to have go big. It's something how the interwebs work. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no rhyme or reason, man. I've, I've, you know, like, <laughs> I, I think I, I on Facebook someone took a video of me playing uh, a Conway Twitty song at a nursing home 2016. It was like right when I was getting started singing a couple years after, and it got hundred thousand odd views. And it was a horrible cell phone video, you know, <laughs> someone filmed from like a 2007 Nokia. It sounded like, but right. <laughs> but for some reason it just whatever for whatever the 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 Facebook gods decided that it was going to be in front of more people than something you spend thousands of dollars on you know yeah it just doesn't make any sense yeah and there's some things that do just kind of have that thing i'm thinking of a daryl singletary song old violin the oh, version yeah. he played with all of the the old quote unquote yeah, I know, has I, bins. I know you're talking about. It. I've seen that video a million times. Oh, me too. And there's just that soul, the trembling lips in these people that were the biggest deal 40 years ago and now nobody knows them. Uh, right. Oh, it was just that was an emotional, awesome. Well, yeah. thank you for keeping the good music going and thank you for being an entrepreneur. Um, I see that as the greatest service to my grandchildren is you creating value and hopefully you make a ton of people happy in homes and a ton of money doing it and sell a bunch of whatever is necessary for you to make a living. uh, No, not make a living, make a thriving uh, sharing your awesome music. Thank you so much for coming Oh, By the way, this is kind of important other than just searching for you. How should people uh, find out more about you? What's your contact? 
All you got to do is go to Facebook, type in Royce Johns, or you can Google Royce Johns. I got a website, uh, but mainly I, I, I keep people updated on Facebook, uh, but I also keep my homepage and my website up to date every month with you know, show dates and uh, when, when a new record comes out, how you can pre-order it. Um, yeah, if, if anything, if, if you got any streaming service, you can get my records on there. Um, but if you'd like physical copy, I, I do them direct from my website and everyone comes from my desk and I hand sign each, each one. So, Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Well, thanks so much for being on today, Royce. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. appreciate it. Daddy spent five out of seven days chasing a dollar down the interstate so mom could stay home and raise us kids. Every night that phone would ring. Catch them up on everything Like where we went With who and what we did Every Friday night he'd pull into the drive Now and then he'd bring a surprise Like a snow globe from Niagara Falls A little toy train from Saginaw Elvis clock with crazy dancing legs Box NASCAR number three, cowboy hat from Tennessee. Yeah, even though he wasn't always here, his love was always near with truck stop souvenirs. Well, he towed home an old Chevy truck. Said, son, me and you can fix her up. Let's get a little grease on our hands. We tore that old rust bucket apart. I knew every nut and bolt by heart. And more than that, I got to know the man. After two long years, she was ready for her first ride. So we dressed her up, tricked her out in style. With a big eight ball for shifting gears Fuzzy dice for the rearview mirror And mud flaps with a naked silver girl A bobblehead doll in a hula skirt More chrome than that truck was worth Man, you can't put a price on those years For what he gave with his love, sweat and tears And truck stop souvenirs Truck stop souvenir.